So I get a lot of questions on the channel about how solo RPG sessions evolve when I am just playing on my own. And I thought I would dip into what I'm doing right now to talk about that a little bit because it I have a solo session that's evolving using some materials that I was not really planning on using as a solo session as well as materials that I had been wanting to talk about on the channel anyway. So in this video I'm just going to tell you a little bit about this solo session here and what's going on is I sat down to play Citadel of Blood. Citadel of Blood is a game that I've done a video on and you could see the link to that video up here. I've also done a video on Death Maze which is the sister game, the first game to Citadel of Blood and you can see the link to that video around up here. So Citadel of Blood was an Ares magazine game and it was featured in number 5, 1980, Ares Magazine, number 5, 1980. And it is described as a daring party of adventurers trapped in a deadly maze. And as with, I believe, all the Ares Magazine games, you had the game, the rules, and the counters, but you also had some type of article or piece about the game. And in this case, it's called, it's referred to as a simulation game. And you get a historical, historical background on the story here and who built the Citadel and why and what is the story behind the need to destroy the, to go through the gateways and, and destroy the evil presence that's lurking there. Now, I noticed in, I noticed actually just now, I don't know whether I mentioned this in the original video that I did on Citadel of Blood, and I have not yet gone back to figure that out. But in the back of the magazine here, there is a, there's a survey here, questions about games that, uh, articles, they ask their readers to rate their articles and people that they've read, authors that they've read and, and games that Ares has produced. And then it says, please write the following game proposals on a scale from one to nine with one indicating very little inclination to buy the game if published up through nine indicating a definite intention to purchase it. And what's interesting here and I'm pretty sure this never was made, but what's interesting here is 92 is called Randomized Dungeon Generation Kit, a more sophisticated version of the Death Maze system, which is the Citadel Blood game as well as Death Maze, for generating random mazes, dungeons, and labyrinths. The package would include four to eight pages of rules and 400 counters and could be used with Dragon Quest or any other fantasy role-playing game. That would be boxed for six bucks. Now, I venture to guess they could make this a Kickstarter right now if they existed and it would explode. That said, I don't think that was ever done. And if anyone knows whether that was ever made, please let me know in the comments because I would be interested in presenting it on the channel if I could find it. But the point being that even for the Citadel of Blood designers, there was a thought that this could somehow be matched with a role-playing system. That was not my intention when I set out to play this game. I've been a little bit this year spending time going back to games that I own, replaying them, and trying to assess as I consider downsizing my game collection, whether I should be keeping things or not. And Citadel of Blood didn't exactly fall into that category because it doesn't take up that much space. Although I think it can be sold. People want to get their hands on this game, but I wasn't really thinking of selling it. But just in the context of looking through other games I have, I thought, well, I want to get this one out again and play it. And that's exactly what I did. Basically what you do in this game, and I won't go through it in such great detail, is you are creating a dungeon with these modular tiles that you draw blindly from a huge double-sided stack of tiles. And you have your party. We have a six-member party with 
three main characters and three what are known as initiates. And you travel through, you fight monsters, you encounter things in the dungeon if they are so indicated. So for example, this indicates a room with some art in it. And then you are rolling on a bunch of tables in here to determine what are the room features, what type of trap might it be, who are the monsters in the room, etc. You can fight the monsters, you can try to bribe them, you can try to negotiate with them. All the while you are looking for something called a Hellgate and you are needing to get through the dungeon to get to the Hellgate. Now, in the context of my game, what happened was I started going through, I encountered a mirror right away, which is great because you need that to find one of the end conditions, which is what level the Hellgate is on. And in my case, it would be level three, which is the final level of the dungeon. Then I came to this room with a piece of art in it and it had an evil mage and I got some treasure and it was really great. And then as things go, I came to this room and this innocent looking square was a trap. And indeed it was a trap floor where my character who was attempting to detrap it fell through the floor and encountered what was there. And what was there in that case was this vampire. My poor character was alone with the vampire and my character, well, his name here on the chit is Zurich. But when I was writing up the characters later on as this evolved into a solo RPG, I miswrote it as Zerky and I decided I liked Zerky better. So Zerky he is. Zerky fell down into a room and faced off against this vampire. Though the vampire ended up not having too many hit points, he was unfortunately able to charm Zerky. Now the rest of the party waited above and were sort of looking down, wondering what to do. If I stuck with Citadel of Blood at that point, practically speaking, what it would have meant was Zerky was out of the game and I would continue along with five characters. Now I've played this game many times before, and I know that even with six characters, it can be challenging to get through the game. So losing an, an entire character and the reason that I had Zerky the dwarf being, well, he had the highest D-trap value, but he was also at the headline with a magical dagger of plus three, and he had a plus two ax. These are good things. He was a strong character. Losing one of my strongest characters right away is problematic for playing Citadel of Blood. So that was number one. And then number two, I thought, well, if Zerky fell through the floor, perhaps during the rest of the game, when a wandering monster check turned up a wandering monster, instead of it being a random wandering monster per the Citadel of Blood rules, I could make it be the vampire with Zerky because he's wandering around with Zerky under his spell. And then I could have my characters, per the rules of Citadel of Blood, attempt to negotiate with the vampire to get Zerky back. That was sort of step one in my thinking. And I set out to continue playing the game. And then I thought, you know, this is really feeling to me like the sort of organic development of a story. And I thought back at that point to some of the things that I have written about in the Solo GM Guide in terms of using game resources to generate a story and the ways in which stories can develop in solo RPG and how the mindset of a solo GM is so key to a successful solo session. And I thought, well, I should refer to my own book and sort of think more about that. And that's when I realized that this was the basis of a solo session. So what I needed to do next, again, thinking through the principles and ideas in the solo GM guide, was to get an appropriate rubric for play. So a rubric, as I talked about in other videos and in the Solo GM Guide, it's not just a fancy way of 
saying rules, that it has other meanings, including a set of guidelines or customs or established procedures, and in teaching circles, the traditions in place to promote certain learning objectives. So I wrote that I use the word because it reminds me that like rubrics, rules are meant to be strong suggestions of customs of play rather than strict requirements. In RPGs, rules are meant to recommend direction. Following them to the letter is not mandatory. And in fact, for the soloist, knowing how, when, and why to ignore the rules is imperative. And so this is why I talk about a rubric as one of the four elements needed to put together a solo RPG session. And in thinking about what to do, well, I'll say two things. Getting back to Citadel of Blood for a second, it itself says at the outset just of this game in line with the concept of rubric rubric rather than rules, it says here that um, the rules are designed to allow the players to easily modify them and invent their own. Players are encouraged to do this And it's said that it should be noted that this style of game makes it impossible to cover every question which will arise during play. So players should use common sense or a die roll to settle disputes. So in this particular case, dating back to the 1980 version of the Dungeon Crawl, there's an explicit understanding that Dungeon Crawls are going to be entailing many different elements that can't be covered in the rules. And I think this is a slight digression, but what's happening today with the proliferation, it seems to me, of kind of overblown, dungeon crawl, bloated, massive boxes is because people are attempting to corral this form into something where everything can be covered in a rule and everything can be covered in a card or a mechanic. And that is what's meant to present like an RPG-like dungeon crawl board game when in fact what you're getting is almost the opposite of what the origins of role-playing instructed, which is to just basically figure it out yourself. So back to the concept of finding a rubric to go with my, I started out with this, basically a, the type of resource that I was using with the Citadel of Blood. That was a, what I call a suggestive resource, something that is already giving you some direction as a framework. And then I needed the rubric. I wanted to get something contemporary to Citadel, which was from 1980, as mentioned. And I thought of going to the Holmes rules for D&D. And I'm not going to get into a whole history of early D&D. There's a ton of channels and people that know way more about it than I do. So you can seek that out on your own if you're interested. But in brief, the Holmes rules here are an edited version. Well, it says right here, this book is based on the original work published in 1974 and three supplementary booklets published in the two-year period after the initial release of D&D. It's aimed solely at introducing the reader to the concepts of fantasy role-playing and the basic play of this game. So it limits itself to the basics and it further goes on to say that it's limited to the first three levels of player progression and the instructions for the GM are kept to a minimum. So I felt like this was a good starting point And then in addition to using that, I've got two other related documents that came, that I'm going to bring into play or that I have brought into play here. One is called Blue Home. This is uh, subtitled Prentice Rules by Michael Thomas. And this document is dated, let's see, Well, I have uh, the fourth printing of the first edition from 2017 as we look at the credits here. And I purchased this somewhere online. I think it's pretty widely available. And so what is this? Well, this is basically like a reorganization of that. So this is a sort of further update and streamlining. And again, I'm not in this video going to get into the details of 
what is done here in the rules, except to say that I felt that this would be appropriate mechanically to the characters that I was starting out with that I then needed to modify to get into this system. And if there's interest on the channel and my getting into more depth with these, you know, let me know and I'll do that. And then the final thing I found, so that is going, that became my rubric. And then I got, I went a little bit further and I pulled out something I've also printed out a while ago that I have not yet brought to the channel, which is the Holmes reference sheets. And these come from, I'll put this link down below, an incredible blog that is available online with a ton of information about this rule set and probably the most comprehensive that I've seen, including a whole bunch of freely available, downloadable material. And this material comes in a number of different forms. You've got things like a character creation worksheet, and you also have things like a random name generator, which I used for my characters, character background. So now we're getting into of the four components for solo RPG that I talk about in my book. Now we're getting into a generative resource, a, some random tables. And in this case, they're linked specifically to the rubric that I'm using. So I went to, as a way of beginning to take my very basic characters. So I decided to choose four of my six characters from the Citadel of Blood game. So in Citadel of Blood, you have really no stats whatsoever. You have a very, very basic uh, designation of a weapon with a skill that's going to add a bonus to a die roll. You have some wound points. You have a race, but it doesn't really give you that much differentiation. You might have a skill or something like that. And that's basically it. So I needed to create to make my characters be able to do what I wanted them to do, which was initially to follow, to attempt to go down into that trap area and follow and chase down the vampire who had charmed the Zerki from their party. So Zerki became Zerki the Taken. As a way of beginning to turn the Citadel of Blood characters into D&D &D characters based on the Holmes edition, I started by rolling on this table. And I just did it randomly. I started with Zerky and I rolled up that he became a flyer, or he had this background of a flyer with aerial combat training and tumbling. So he got one minus one point per die falling damage. And that actually, I decided was thematic. He also has a potion of flying and some leather armor and things that became thematic because I linked him to the vampire. I started to develop a story that actually it wasn't necessarily an accident that um, Zerky was the one who fell into the the trap and was taken by the vampire that perhaps he himself with this flying background. Now we know vampires don't fly, but the vampire bats do. And perhaps he was, I don't know, perhaps he was somebody that was already in relation to the vampire and the connection was there. I'm still developing this as I'm playing, but that is a question. So I use this kind of generative thing to begin there. And then I continued rolling on the table until I got some other answers. And then I did pair the answer with the character. So for example, when I rolled on a caveman background, basically like a tough guy who is illiterate, doesn't wear armor, is a good hunter, I turned that into my dwarf A and I got using this generator of random syllables and names, I came up with Akmil the Grizzled, who was a caveman, and that was his background. He is a dwarf. And then 
I continued to do that and I ended up with an, an archer character and my Fark, Farnos from above, who is a barkeep and he's an elf and he's a negotiator and he's a kind of like wily character, very social. And that it became the party. So using, going a little bit deeper, getting these generative uh, tables here helped me initially to start to give my character some personality. And then, and only then, I went to using, to getting some stats for them. Because again, as I talk about repeatedly in the Solo GM Guide and give examples and reasons why, that stats are not a story and that numbers do not make narrative. And what that means is that when developing a solo RPG like this, kind of organically out of something I'm playing, I already had the story. I already had action happening, which is why I felt the the need to, or the desire to create a solo experience out of it and not just stick to the Citadel of Blood. So the stats that I need and that I will be, or I did create to make the mechanics work moving forward, I put those stats onto the characters to make it support the character that I already had, if that makes any sense. So to, in another thing that's very helpful here in all this supporting Holmes material is a section that will just break down exactly what stat in the attributes actually has an impact in the game. Because with the original rules, there are some stats that really don't. So for example, there's a really useful section here on rolling up an adventurer, and it is explaining what the actual rules as written do versus what other options for play are. So for example, in the rules as written, your strength attribute really doesn't do anything. But the Gygaxian option is that if you have a strength of 15 or more, you get a plus one to hit. So I gave my caveman that stat of 15 or more strength to get that modifier because that fit the character, if that makes any sense. It's approaching it in a backwards way. It's approaching it in a manner that I venture to guess would not be done in a traditional RPG situation sitting around the table with a GM. But as we know, solo RPG doesn't follow those rules and it is not that type of situation. And so to start to tie up the little package of what I had here with my characters in a story, that's how I came into making the stats because I am, in terms of putting together the four pieces of the four aspects of a solo RPG session, again, beginning with something that was suggestive, the Citadel of Blood, and then moving to the rubric, moving to the, to the generative. And then finally, we're just looking for some type of oracle. And the oracle that I'm sticking with or that I have been sticking with is the super basic one that is here. And it's just a very basic yes, no D100 system because I don't really need anything else. I'm not overcomplicating this. It's remaining true to its roots as a very basic dungeon crawl with a situation in this case where the quest has become to save our party member. And then my plan is, I'm still playing it out, once Zerky is back with the party to go all the way back to the Citadel and then continue on playing through just basically back to these rules. So we had a whole side development of a story. Hopefully we'll get our character back and then we'll continue to play. And so it is through that process that almost by accident, I ended up or I'm, I am ending up in the middle of playing out this other story. And the reason that I wanted to present this information in 
the video is because I do think that there are people still who feel like the lift to getting to a solo RPG session is very heavy and that you need a ton of source material, you need a ton of rule sets, a ton of minis, a ton of lots of different elements to be able to get there. And it's my contention that you don't need very much at all beyond an imagination and maybe some basic understanding of what makes a story work, the elements that go into a story. And this is another thing that I talk a lot about in on my channel and in the Solo GM Guide, that it really is story-based and understanding what makes a story and how to generate interest or the what, the reason that interest is generated in narrative and that um, you can use things that you have already at your disposal to do that and you can take cues from things that you have in order to do that so that you are using an appropriate rubric so that you are using appropriate generative and suggestive resources and not getting too bogged down in so many complicated oracles that you're hiding behind them to get to your story because if you have a story and a narrative that's strong enough you don't need to rely on yes, no generators that can bog you down in ways that aren't helpful ultimately. So I hope that um, this look a little bit behind the scenes of just something I was randomly doing was useful to people. Let me know in the comments if there's anything, any aspect of this that you're interested in further, such as the, um, the Holmes rules. And I will put links down below to all these things. Citadel is not um, easily available now, but if you know how to search on the internet, you know, you can obviously try to set up notifications to get there if somebody happens to be selling it. Highly recommend trying to track it down as well as Death Maze. They are, um, even after all these years, really very replayable.